It's a good evening, and thank you for coming out. Um, I'm Dirk Philipson, and I want to talk to you a little bit about <coughs> well-being economies. Um, a huge topic, so we're going to today just give you a couple of teasers, um, some of the core ideas that we think are really important. And then we, I think we have like, what, an hour and a half or something? OK. Um, we don't want to just talk to you. We want to talk with you. And we want to also engage you in some conversations and deliberations on some of the key questions that uh, we think are important to think about. So why well-being economies, for one? Um, well, because in part, we think that economies increasingly play a central role in the way we think about ourselves, the way we organize societies. Uh, what goals we set for ourselves and what values we have and uh, how we measure success. Um, so when we think about modern economies, the characteristics of modern economies, there are, it's obviously a super complicated question and there are a lot of things that we could think about and talk about, uh, including the fact that there are ecological limits, apparently. Uh, including the fact that change is happening ever more quickly, uh, including the fact that ever more things in life become part of a market and become commodified. In other words, they are being sold and bought in the marketplace. We want to focus on one particular element today, um, or I want to focus on one particular element in my introduction, which is growth. Um, so imagine for a minute, if you can, a uh, investment banker, say, in a custom-tailored suit, driving his obscenely large SUV at a red light through an intersection, causing a major accident on his way to his divorce lawyer. What you have here is what could be called an economic hero. Because that person will, in that one day, have contributed more to the one thing that we measure more than anything else when it comes to the success of the economy, which is GDP. BIP, I think it is called in German. That is the central metric that tells us whether an economy is doing well. Is it increasing? People are happy. If it decreases, we have a name for that. We call it a recession. If it decreases for a longer period of time, we call it a depression. And bad things begin to happen. People don't invest anymore. People lose jobs. The economy declines. Now, I just want to highlight a couple of things that we could learn from that story. The first one, of course, is that BIP, or GDP, in no shape or form measures well-being. Neither the SUV, nor the speeding, nor the divorce lawyer, nor the accident actually contributes to anybody's well-being. Right? So what GDP actually measures is nothing other than um, commodities that are being exchanged in the marketplace. It matters not whether these are toys or weapons, whether it is art or pornography, whether it is services that contribute to people's well-being or whether it is services that take away from people's well-being. As long as they are sold in the marketplace, they contribute to GDP. And so it is not too much to say that something like war, for instance, would be an enormous contributor to GDP for the simple reason that there are a lot of things happening in war that contribute to exchanges in the marketplace and that then destroy things that need to be replaced and so on and so forth. So BIP or GDP is not a good measure. Now, 
you, most of you probably have heard about initiatives in Germany and the EU and the World Bank and the United States and lots of different places that go beyond GDP. Right? It is ba basically people trying to figure out, can we come up with a metric that measures what we actually want and what we like better? None of these initiatives have really changed terribly much. And the reason is, I would suggest, that there is an underlying even bigger problem than the metric, which is not good, and that is economic growth itself. Um, economic growth is something that today is baked into literally every aspect of our lives. Whether, and, and in some cases, it is a good thing, right? So if you put money into the bank, you would like it to grow. If you put money into a, an investment account for yourself or your children, you'd like it to grow. If you start a business, you'd like it to grow. Right? But of course, we also know that growth leads to a lot of bad things. Right? We deplete resources, we destroy the environment, we create more stress, we create more transformation, and on and on and on. Right? And so, in some ways, I want to highlight the sort of basic problem that we're facing. And that is, quite simply, uh, and Catherine and I are doing research right now, talking to sort of opinion leaders in business, finance, and politics. And so far, this proves to be absolutely correct. People who have leadership positions in our society this is true in Germany as much as it is in France and China and India and the United States, are people who say that we absolutely need growth. That in fact, opportunity, progress, well-being comes with growth. That the only way we can address things like climate change is through growth. Growth of science, technology, and so on. There's literally nobody in a leading position anywhere that I have found, certainly not in governments around the world that questions that paradigm. Juxtapose with that the fact that more and more scientists are telling us that it is simply suicide to continue to grow. That we simply cannot grow any longer. For the simple reason that we live on a finite planet. For the simple reason that all growth has a material throughput. For the simple reason that economic growth is not linear but exponential. I could give you all sorts of graphs on that, but the fact of the matter is that, oh, you, can, can you? Set? Yeah, so here, here's one, one, one graph that shows this really nicely, I think better than any I have seen. It's, it's juxtaposing what is happening in society to what is happening to Earth systems. And of course, what you see in virtually all cases is an exponential curve of, for instance, world population growing, GDP growing, foreign direct investment growing, urban populations growing, and so on and so forth, with exponential growth in both pollution and extraction. You show this to any smart five-year-old and the five-year-old will immediately tell you that ain't gonna work. There's no way this is going to work long-term. Right? So what the Well-Being Economy Alliance is ultimately about is that we are saying a basic simple thing. One, we cannot continue to grow and we need to come up with a better alternative. And two, what we should really be doing, and this is the conversation we want to have with you, is focus not on expansion, profits, and growth, some of which is good, some of which is bad, some of which is neutral, most of which is dangerous, but rather on well-being of planet and people. <coughs> The focus in our democracies ought to be what, does it, what 
directly contributes to our well-being and the well-being of our planet. Because if we don't ask the question, if we don't focus on it, we will continue with the system. Can, can, you, can I have the next? And so I leave you with a slightly different image than the um, investment banker. And that is a train racing towards the cliff. Every expert in the world tells us that the only solution to racing towards the cliff is to, you guessed it, speed up. Make the train faster. Most political conversations today, this is true in the United States as much as in Germany, are about things like, should we not replace the diesel engine with solar panels? Should we not have things like, you know, more children participate in the conversations in the cockpit? Should we not have more women be train conductors? All of these are really important questions. None of them change the fact that the train is still on the same track and is still racing towards the cliffs and still speeding up. So what we need, really, is for people to open the shades, look outside and say, we got to stop this train. And we need to have an open, transparent, democratic conversation about a new direction for that trade, and preferably one that leads us towards a well-being economy that serves people and planet. Thank you. Oh, yep. Yeah. Oh, sorry. I'll get like this. Great. Thank you, Dirk. And I want to also say thank you because I suspect you've all come down to my non-German speaking lowest common denominator. So thank you for that and forgive my, my lack of German. But I'm really, really excited to be here and thanks so much to Tan and Sebastian and everyone at Better House for hosting us. And, and thanks for you all coming along on this beautiful Wednesday evening to talk about economics. Um, I hope it's not just because there was beer promised, but really, really grateful for you giving us your time. Uh, it has been said that the current economy is not just, it's not intelligent, it is not beautiful, and it is not virtuous. And you can see that in so many different indicators. Uh, if you look at the charts like the one that Dirk has showed you, if you look at the protests that are building up around the world, if you look at the sort of politics and levels of inequality that is emerging, we certainly don't have an economic system that is just or intelligent or virtuous or beautiful. In fact, as we've heard, it's an economic system that is putting the, the planet on fire. And the same person who made that observation also said, in short, we, it doesn't deliver the goods and we are beginning to despise it. And again, you see people's sort of growing hatred and sense of precariousness and frustration at the current economic system, and they're turning for coping solutions, whether it's at the pill box or at the ballot box. And this same person then said, but when it comes to put something in its place, we are extremely perplexed. And that was John Maynard Keynes writing in 1933. And I think now, halfway through 2019, with all the collective wisdom and ideas and imaginations of people like you and people in meetings like this around the world, people who are practitioners are rolling up their sleeves to say actually we can create a more humane, more sustainable economic system. We do know what to put in its place. We are no longer perplexed. And we're going to talk with you all and get you to talk amongst yourselves a little bit about what that economic system that's different, that we call a well-being economy, we're not really fussed what you call it yourselves, but it just, it's basically about an economy that is repurposed to deliver human and ecological well-being. The question though is, how the hell do we go about creating that, given all the lock-ins that Dirk has outlined, just how sticky this current economic system is? And so, kind of you click over, that's why this new but mighty organisation, the Wellbeing Economy Alliance, which so beautifully shortens to we all, was created. It was folks around the world saying we need to collaborate to try and build system change. And so I want to tell you a bit about We All and hope that you'll get involved and hope you feel welcome to be part of this growing movement. 
And a key part of what we're doing is, in a way, is our theory of change. It's about creating the knowledge base and the narratives and the power base to build towards economic system change. And I'll just tell you a little bit more about that, Tan, if you flip through. And again, we have to change how we talk about the economy. We need new stories to open up people's imaginations, to get us out of this narrow cognitive bandwidth that keeps us thinking that the only solution and the only option is more of the same. You know, everyone's favorite politician, Margaret Thatcher, once said, you know, Tina, there is no alternative. But actually, when we look around the world, we see it's a matter of Tata. There are thousands of alternatives. And that comes down to the stories that we tell ourselves about a different economic system. So that's a key part of what WEALS is about. And that's founded also on collating all the evidence base, whether it's in academic journals, whether it's a practitioner knowledge, the people who are delivering this, who know how change needs to happen. Tiny, if you click through. And it's also about working together to build a power base, to build a vanguard, as our, our chair talks about, to create change. Click again. Because this is really, really hard work. It is going against the grain of so much dogma and orthodoxy in so many textbooks and so much mainstream thinking, whether it's in the media or politics. And this was a cartoon that was sent to me from a, a friend in Australia who was at the forefront of fighting for equal marriage in Australia. And, and he said, quite literally, this is, has been his experience. And this has been our experience in saying, hang on a minute. We're not sure about GDP. People first laugh at you and they say, come on, GDP is the best measure in town. But actually, I don't need to have that conversation anymore. People are starting to recognize the flaws of GDP. Still not got the perfect alternative, but at least the conversation is opening up. Political scientists would call this opening up the Overton window, basically moving the public conversation along so that we can then start moving politicians into that new space. Click through. Thank you. And it's also about building these power bases that convince and support policymakers to change, to bring in the sort of legislation and the tax system and the changes that we need so that the regime is supporting all the amazing work that is already happening in microcosm that embodies what a wellbeing economy looks like. And this is something that we've been really key in instigating. And this is a group of governments who are saying, we recognize that in the 21st century, the success of a country, our purpose, you know, the notion of development is no longer about faster, faster GDP growth. It's about creating an economic system that delivers human and ecological well-being. And those governments have got together saying, we don't have all the answers on our own, but if we work together, then we can start to change things and collaborate and learn and share and just experiment together and also have each other's backs. And so this was launched last November at the big OECD Wellbeing Forum in South Korea, led by Scotland, where I live. I'm very proud of those little Scots. But teaming up with New Zealand and Iceland to say we want to work with others. And there's loads of other governments who are coming on board saying we want to be part of this as well. And it's rather nicely, this shortens to we go. Thanks, Tan. But it's also about saying what does this big global movement, how does it collapse down? And what's its footprint? What's its version? How, what's its iteration in geographical locations? And again, you're going to see my bias here. I'm really proud of what's happening in Scotland. But Scotland is at one of our leading, most mature geographic hubs. Uh, but there are other wheel hubs popping up in Canada, in New Zealand, in Costa Rica, in Boulder, in Australia. There's all these hubs. And we're really hoping um, and really excited and keen to invite you to be part of a conversation about building a hub in Berlin or in, in Germany writ large. And essentially, it's a similar picture to what's happening at the global level, but essentially saying we want to work not just in our silos, not just in the environment sector, or not just in the pro-social business sector, or not just in the social justice sector, but we want to work together across sectors to build alliances and start to build that power base for change. Again, time, thank you. And one of the most wonderful things in our just over a year old life is how young people have been coming to us and saying, you know those signs that we often hold up that say system change, not climate change. We want to be part of changing the system and we all is a key vehicle. And so led by young people, these particularly young women like this based in the Netherlands, we now have we all youth hubs led by the Netherlands, but in Johannesburg, in Uganda, in Melbourne, in Warwick in the south of England, in Boulder in the US. Just young people saying, again, we want to be part of this movement to change the economic system. We want to learn from all this expertise and ideas and practitioner knowledge that's coming from this wider movement. 
and translate it into our own work. Thanks, Tom. And we've recently launched something that you are all so very welcome to be part of. It's, it's recently been described to us as an ethical Facebook, and it's called We All Citizens. Because not everyone is doing this in their day job, or even if they are, they can feel really quite isolated. But this is about connecting people wherever they are in the world, but if they have a sense that business as usual cannot carry on. And so they want to connect with others, to share hope, to add value to each other's work, to learn from each other. And the conversations that are happening on this platform are, are really quite extraordinary. We've had people from the Philippines advising folks in New Zealand, folks in Uganda joining the youth cause and so on. It's really quite beautiful. It's really young and we're still testing it. So please jump on board and give us your feedback. And it's completely free. This is our gift to, to the movement. I heard a lovely phrase recently, this idea of being movement generous. And if you want, you can create your own closed group here if it's helpful for you to organise. So have a, have a play around on We All Citizens and just become part of this wider conversation. Thank you, Tan. And essentially, this is our crazy, lovely, beautiful, cheeky, little bit tipsy um, Wellbeing Economy Alliance family. Um, we are so conscious about the importance of gathering together in face-to-face -to -face and also online spaces to connect, to learn from each other, to support each other. We had a members call this morning where a colleague from We All in Australia was saying that he'd, he'd gone to an event and he made a suggestion and it totally bombed. And he was saying, is it because I framed it the wrong way? Or was it because I didn't pitch it the right way? And you know, it's a, a bit of a shoulder to cry on as well. And it's essentially about building solidarity amongst this. Because when you're going up against the system, when you're trying to irritate that system so that it becomes fragile and changes, it is really, really hard, lonely work. Thanks, Tom. And essentially, though, this really is our theory of change. This idea that if we work together, gosh, and let's hope so, we can achieve extraordinary things. So thank you so much. And please, you are so very welcome. Our mantra for joining is <coughs> if you want to work with others to make the economy more humane and more sustainable, then you are welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Hmm? And one more. One more. Yeah. So, um, with your collaboration, this is this is the next thing we would like to do, which is um, you talk to your neighbor about what an ideal city would look like to you, one that is. Uh, conducive to life for planet and people. Um, and so I want to just say a couple things about this uh, in order to uh, spark your thinking about this. Um, I grew up in a society that is, for all intents and purposes, extremely car-centered. As a young man, I loved cars. I knew everything about cars. I could tell you what car it was, what it drove by, just by the sound of it. It was not until about 10 years ago when I listened to a talk by the former mayor of Bogota, Enrique Peñalosa, who talked about um, the fact that we all now in modern societies live in cities that are essentially organized and designed around the needs of cars and not the needs of people. And I thought that was a little, you know, bit of a stretch perhaps as a claim. And then he said, for instance, in the United States, every big city today dedicates more space to cars than it dedicates to people. Turns out that's true. And when you think about it for a minute, I think this is absolutely, utterly obscene. And of course, the United States is particularly bad in this, but in Germany you find this too. You find urban sprawl and you find a lot of commuting. And commuting, by the way, is one of those things. Survey after survey shows this. It doesn't matter whether you go to China, India, France, or Germany, or the United States. What is the one activity that people like the least in their day? It's commuting in the car back and forth from work. 
people often, people rarely actually think about the expense of a car. And who actually finances the infrastructure that we build for cars? How much time do you spend in your job in order to work to make the money that pays for the car, maintains the car, cleans the car, fuels the car? Right? And last but not least, of course, we now know, and this makes Germans particularly nervous, that cars are an ecological problem of the highest order. Right? So I just want to give this as one example. We could also talk about um, who owns urban spaces, or we could talk about um, uh, apartments and who owns those and who has access to those and who pays for those and how much of your income goes towards paying for rent. Uh, many, many other topics that you could talk about. And so, why don't you spend some 15 or so minutes talking to your neighbor about how you would design your ideal city so that we can then have a conversation back and forth uh, afterwards and collect your ideas to see what might be necessary in order to bring about those kinds of changes. Okay? So talk to your neighbor. Have fun. Stop. Music stopped. <laughs> so we were hoping to gather some of the brush strokes of your ideas and start to. That's way too. That's a little too much. Yeah. Wait. It has. <sighs> Thank you. Better. Is that? It's not even on. Oh, it is on. Okay. Okay. So we were hoping just to get you to share with us some of the ideas for this city that's people and planet centered so we can get a sense of what does this start to look like you know what's what's the vision that's emerging here and emerging Sita that's emerging here on, on a Wednesday afternoon after a few beers so you click forward Tan is going to start to type in so just put up your hand and for the sake of the mic I might repeat it but um, but share with us, you know, what, what does this look like? What are some of the key characteristics? Give, give us a sort of sense of painting this picture of a, a city that starts to deliver human and ecological well-being. And so try to keep it reasonably short so that everybody gets a chance to talk. Yeah. And just if you want to say who you are in the name of connection and yeah. collaboration, Great. Feel, feel free. Yeah, go. Cool. Yeah, I'm Johnny. I would say that uh, free public transport, equal and accessible to all citizens, and also to have that be uh, as much as possible powered by renewable energy, so due to electric trains and electric buses, that that would be. And then, then placing restrictions on more. We, we disagreed on this. I said we should ban cars. But ban <laughs> cars? <laughs> yeah. Okay. Sort of power everything. Really and what sort of cars would you allow? What sort of cars would you allow if you want that an outright ban? I mean, I don't think the solution is just ban. And do you know what would be really good if we can do the Christine Lagarde thing and go man, woman, man, woman, so it's not just male voices. <laughs> so women. Yeah. And we were talking about living spaces and apartments, and we thought it's kind of ridiculous that we all want to have our own big apartment, whatever, our own stuff. So why could we not um, go to sharing apartments more, creating different concepts for living, mm -hmm. and um, also not only solving that space problem, but solving yeah. yeah, and we used to do that in the you know in the old days in Glasgow. They've got these where I live. They've got these tenements, and they all shared one washing space. Mm -hmm. And now in those very same buildings, we all have our own washing machine that we use what once or twice twice a week. Yeah, that, yeah. Thanks for waiting. Uh, hi, my name is Andrew. We had two points. I guess some of related to the first two. Um, the first one around public transport was rather than 
looking at expanding public transport or building wider roads or any of that is to actually think more about why people need to travel mm -hmm. um, and question yeah, why people need to leave home, where they're going to, and even what time of the day that they need to do it. Yeah. So rather than build a public transport system that can handle the maximum capacity between 8 and 9 a.m., uh -huh. can we incentivize people and businesses to send people to work at different times, mm -hmm. or get people to work from home, or even make a, like the equivalent of a keto, you have a keto on every block, block here. Why can't the, you have something like a keto that's a co-working space for 10 or 20 people? <laughs> the, the second point that Simon made relating to the public transport and, and the banning of the cars was what happens with people in rural areas? Mm. There, there is still a limit as to what public transport can do for mm. people in rural areas. So we, hadn't, we didn't have a solution for it, mm. but just the question of um, you can make this stuff happen in big urban cities, but what happens yeah. when you go in the poor or the rural would make a reflection on that, is that yeah just real quick I mean we, we were talking about this um, when we came up with the exercise in the first place and of course as you all know more and more people are moving to cities so that in Germany I think 75 or 80 percent of people now live in you know in, in urban areas um, so that doesn't neglect the fact that there are different sets of issues and challenges in rural areas um, but of course, there are also quite a few models with buses and so on and so forth as to how you could make that happen as well. Right? But it's maybe I think one your flexible working I think takes us into a conversation about shared work and how do we redistribute labour more. I think that's right. really exciting. But the point about the rural communities who perhaps still need need cars for various re reasons is Simon or yeah. Simon or Andrew. Yeah, your point. To me, there's a global parallel of that too in terms of using. The ecological space, and there's a sense, you know, if those of us in the north, for want of a better term, don't make ecological room for those who still need to grow to meet their basic needs. So there's something about recognizing when, wherever we are, we've got enough, um, and how to deliver for those who still need it. That the the car example, the rural community example, I think has sparked too. Right, who's Veronica. Uh, Veronica, um, I just wanted to hit on a similar point that we started discussing it but didn't quite get around to it because I thought we could um, So what is it about work and why the commutes and how do we make them better? And it's about reducing the disparity of food between rural and urban. So the idea that we definitely need calm in rural spaces, I'm not so sure. At the moment, yes, if they're very remote, absolutely, and that will remain so. But if we had more decentralized working hubs, and I'm not talking remote working because there's heaps of studies that have shown that people are unhappy when work are less productively if they have to telework too much. And it's not good for their own well-being, and it's not good for the company atmosphere as well quite often. So it can work sometimes, but not all the time. So you will still have to have that. But I do think there could be a lot of investment in rural areas. It is a catch-22. If you don't provide public transport in rural areas, you won't provide, you, people won't use it if the bus is only once an hour. Exactly. If you do it more to the needs of the people, they use it and maybe leave the car behind. Mm -hmm. Quick other point on the shared apartments. So I'm 43. I have had now 103 flatmates. I didn't <laughs> wish for one to live on my own. <laughs> Can I just point out that tenements in Glasgow might not be a good example of what hygienic <laughs> good shared living might look like. And I've lived in London for 14 years, and the shared apartment you see there, we might be digging our own holes. So it was serious that somebody suggesting that we should do away with minimum size plans for flats because the younger millennial generation is working in co-working spaces, mm. doesn't spend time on their own, so they only need 20 square metres to live on. That's the yeah. wrong way to go about There's it. something there about how we look after the, the commons, which may be a washing machine in a close in Glasgow. Yes. <laughs> so you folks, you might think you're in the dark because these guys are all lit up, but I'd love to hear your, your views. Yeah, far away. Uh, yeah, Christian, my name. Uh, to me, a key game changer would be with e-mobility, we can eliminate um, the noise pollution in the city and the air pollution, and this would be a major difference to me. By e-mobility, you mean like e-cars and e-scooters and e-bikes and, e and, and stuff?
Queen of Queen Zotia, which I think is worth oh, sharing. Sure. Sure. <laughs> so, of course, it would indeed be uh, in mobility and then the uh, uh, traffic streets would go underground. So there is a proper balance between city life and nature. Um, so, um, as we discussed about, okay, what there is a city and why would you live in the countryside? Um, but also things like inner venues, if you still are very stressed, you might need to consume a lot, and the of consuming would be slower, and if you are happy within yourself, you can find that within yourself. You don't need to, you know, eat love sugar to, mm -hmm. you know, get the sweetness from outside, or get all the, you know, uh, shoes and clothes to make you happy, so um, we also do the inner work there, um, yeah, so I thought that was just interesting to mention, that he brought this up, the stress factor, mm -hmm. if you take this out, and you feel more relaxed, this will ripple out into yeah. many uh, parts, also the, uh, Habits, perhaps. Yeah, something, that, um, something we talk about in, in this book here is this mm -hmm. idea that a political economist from France, Sergei Latouche, and he talks about the consolation goods industry, how this whole companies and sectors who make their money basically selling things to console us for our stressful, precarious lives. And, you know, right through from the, the pamper weekends for women who are told that they can have it all and they need to relax at the end, or the, you know, the bottle of wine after a long, stressful week. Yeah, so, there's, I mean, there's this whole almost you know, fixing what we break in the darkness of us. Yeah, always. Hi, my name's Peter. I will, I'll just build on that, because that's what I was uh, speaking with Michelle about. And I, I don't, it's more of a question, but my ideal situation is that city, cities become places that we begin to interact with each other, maybe in centers around um, well-being and well-care, and to kind of reposition what the narrative is about healthcare, which is like you're getting stressed and you need band-aids to make you feel better, to accessing resources like connecting with other human beings, which have such significant effects on uh, the nervous system and the immune system, uh, connecting with nature for the same reason, so that these patterns of life actually begin to change to optimize like the human organism, mentally, psychologically, physically. So Peter, keep going on that. What would a city look like that encouraged people to connect with each other more? Maybe not as shoppers or as commuters, but as people. Or anyone else jump in, if you can imagine. Or if you've been in a city that does it well or does it nicely, I'll come back to you. Before. I can maybe jump in there. Uh, so we actually talked about uh, the kind of like role of museums mm -hmm. in the city as kind of like a like a safe haven to like escape, you know, the increasing stress, the noise, the like uh, yeah, like uh, basically everything just gets bigger and yeah. faster. And museums have like this beautiful role, similar as like parks, to kind of like yeah, creating room for just um, yeah, being for yourself, like kind of like slowing down grounding yourself, mm -hmm. uh, consuming like art, like connecting yeah. also with other people and talking about um, something which is more, I think, on the human side than like economical side or technological side. And okay. yeah, that I think we need probably more museums to like also like grow in this role of providing this, this space actually. Yeah. Or like a mm -hmm. tent or something. Love that. Oh. An oasis, yeah. Yes. Yeah, fire away. I would dig into the history of humanity also for this. I was thinking of uh, the Amazon River and then the fact that anthropologists found that um, we have quite a few cities in quite a heavy populated area along the Amazon River uh, back a couple of centuries ago. This was like an urban sprawl, they say. And it was, it was heavily populated, and they had a few cities that would compare to medieval cities of Europe. And it was very well developed, and very well structured. Now they're digging bits and pieces out of that to see how they actually live in such harmony with nature and with each other, so that we cannot find even traces of the cities except for the trees that they planted. Actually, realize that the the river was all, the jungle was all planted. It was not, natural there, but it was planted in such a way that it uh, added to harmony, not uh -huh. took away from well-being. So that experience, that history, could be uh, a key for us yeah. also. 
And if you start to imagine, has that got lessons for the materials that we use when we build things or we create roads or for paths? Is it, is it that Absolutely. literal? And then the um, communion with nature. Like now we say, okay, let's have cities with people separately and let's keep half of the earth rest yeah. from the humans. Yeah. I don't think that that's true. I think we should live together and find a way how to be with each other. Mm -hmm. So definitely that means the materials and everything should be completely healthy for the nature and for the humans. Lovely. Lovely. Yeah, I mean, it's it, it really amazing sometimes for me to think about that we see, modern economists see nature as a subsystem to the economy. Right? It's sort of a supply store rather than seeing the economy as part of nature, right? Um, I mean, even your new EU commissioner, von der Leyen, uh, said yesterday in her speech that um, unfortunately more and more people are serving the economy and not the economy, and the economy doesn't serve people, right? So it's, it's percolating up slowly that there is some real problem here, yeah. Somebody else? Yeah. I learned about um, how important green is and how we especially respond to the color green and what we can distinguish there. And I've um, subscribed to something which is called Optimist Daily. It's uh, a daily mail with emissary solutions and really great stories of what cities of what happens all around the world in terms of good news and, and discovery. Mm -hmm. And there, I think it was the city of Milano, Milan, mm -hmm. um, they were well, they're dedicated to have like, I don't know, like millions of mini trees and plants planted by, I'm making up the number, maybe, maybe 20, 30 or so. Um, and there were, I could see graphics or like, mm -hmm. uh, architectural plans of how these would be at the side of the building and on top of the building. So this whole really making the city something that is soothing to the eyes mm -hmm. and soothing to the lungs mm -hmm. and soothing to our nervous system. And, and uh, yeah, also bridge this yeah. distinction. Now I'm in the city, now I go to the forest. Mm -hmm. and, that and you mentioned a city that, Milan? I think Milano. Milan? Milan. 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 Yeah. Okay. No, 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 it's in Italy. Yeah. Okay. As in Milan. Uh -huh. mm -hmm. I mean, that's, if there any, I'd love to hear examples um, too. If there are cities that you've been to or lived in that you think, <coughs> well, you know, these these folks are getting it pretty right. If there's examples of places that you think we can be inspired by, they don't need to be perfect. But you know, are there are there cities that we can learn from that start to embody this? I mean, if I if I just may pick up on on this. Uh, Part of what we all is trying to do is network people who are actually engaged in trying to translate, uh, translate idea into action, to do something, right? And you know, if I were, if you think about this from the perspective of an historian 20 years from now, one of the remarkable things about 2019 is how much we are focused on bad news and how little we know about the millions of people around the world trying to work on solutions, right? And how badly those people are oftentimes networked. And this becomes an enormous problem because when we in politics talk about systemic changes, more radical changes than the kinds of changes that you know, social democrats are proposing, um, more often than not what people very quickly say is, this is not possible, this is not realistic, right? And one of the key messages that we all is trying to sort of um, stimulate is that we all, as we sit here, really literally have no idea what is going to be possible tomorrow. Right? I mean, I can, just, just looking at the last six months, I can give you many examples of things that just happened in the last six months that prior to those six months nobody thought possible. So why do we waste our time thinking about what is and what is not possible and instead think about what is right and what is it that we want to accomplish and what is it that we want to build and then try to do it as best as we can. And part of it is learning from people who are trying to do it all the time. Yeah. So part of my ideal city is hmm? also, I actually live in a city that doesn't exist, uh, Bielefeld. <laughs> <laughs> what? 
what does that mean? Say that to me later. Yeah. <laughs> um, it's an in joke. I, I, I have the delight to look at a real square. A square <coughs> that is like the heart <coughs> chakra of this, this area. And I just dreamt up something like flea markets for good, great solutions so that they're mm -hmm. um, Lovely. regular, not we yep. just trade old clothes, but uh -huh. we create, trade new, new solutions on this. It's lovely. Yeah. We're about to put something like that, um, a set of ideas and support marketplace on We All Citizens. So if that sounds like a good idea, please do So it. our left wing here is a little underrepresented. Go ahead. I just, I just want to throw in a few like, negative emotions. Move into your, the next step. Berlin is doing it. Um, 10 years ago, we were demonstrating against Media Spree. Some of you guys might have been in town already. When uh, Klaus Oberreit, the former mayor, was really selling uh, coastline of the Spree to international investors. And there was, uh, there was many, like, not just spaces, community spaces, by that time, ran by the Berlin cultural scene, you know? Most of them had to close. I was involved with them called Bar 25. We were demonstrating with a large amount of people in front of the Rote Rathaus against Klaus Oberreit, and uh, he still did it. So as you can see now, the skyscrapers and stuff that are on the coastline. One did survive, though, which is actually what's mine. And uh, most of you guys know it, it's a colorful you know, community space, which is still ran by the same people that did Bar 25 back in the day. And I was demonstrating exactly 10 years later, again, a few weeks ago, against the government now that is trying to shut them down and get all the public from that ground by 8 o'clock in the evening, which would mean for them getting bankrupt. Mm -hmm. And still the government still doesn't, I mean, it's not the government, it's maybe the municipality on a lower level, but they still don't seem to get the point that, you know, Berlin's getting, or is still so attractive to, to, to people, not because of skyscrapers on the street, mm -hmm. but because of cultural villages like Hosmark. There are only a few of those left. Mm -hmm. So I would love to have an ideal city where the government is giving space, mm -hmm. is giving the, the good, as the real estate people say, the yeah, mm -hmm. to the community and let creative people, let them pitch or whatever, yeah, but yeah. Let, let, the, let the most creative win, but give it to the people and, and ma make them do community space. But is there something there, Sebastian, about the democracy too, in that if people were saying, we don't want this to happen, and yet it still went ahead, and presumably they were doing analysis, thinking, well, this will improve the economy, which just reinforces all your, your points. I mean, there's something about how we do local democracy too, so that folks, you know, local residents, are they're the ones who are determining the direction of travel of, lo of local economic development. Well, but that time, Berlin was very poor, you know? It, it poor but sexy, I heard. Poor but sexy, yeah. <laughs>
Yeah. Yeah. So. Um, Just go to the next. He's going. <laughs> Which comes to your. So we could talk about a lot of examples and, and how to design cities as, as one particularly good example, I think, and one that we can all relate to. And so I just want to maybe share some parting thoughts on what both the challenges are and some of the opportunities. Um, and get input. And get input. Of course, yes, and, and, and then hear from you what you think about this and what questions you have about it, most importantly. Yes. <laughs> He's learning. <laughs> yes. <laughs> Thank you. Economics 101. <laughs> so I live and work in the United States, and um, one of the interesting things is that the most progressive people in the United States, the, the, the best they can dream of is something like Berlin. <laughs> Literally. <laughs> Um, and then I come to Berlin and I talk to my friends in Berlin and they say, you know, they have a lot of problems. There are a lot of things that are wrong. Um, and so it depends on context. But the issue that we tried to bring to your attention today is that there is a distinct possibility that we have a structural problem that lies beyond whether you are voting for conservatives or social democrats or greens, that lies beyond the question of whether you live in Europe or the United States or India or China, and that is that we all live now in capitalist economies that require growth. And that politicians, as much as business men and women, as much as citizens, do not know how to live outside of that paradigm. And so what you have is increasing alienation of people from politics because people rightly feel that politicians and political apparatuses, systems of governance, no longer really represent the needs and desires of people. And they're right about that. Fundamentally right. And so what's interesting about this, and if you're interested in more detail, you can pick up any of these books, and I'm not trying to sell them to you, but I'm just simply saying that lots of smart people for the last 300 years have thought about this. And political economists around the world over the last 300 years, never assumed that we would just simply continue to grow. The idea was to grow until we have enough, until we have arrived in Catherine terms, Catherine's terms, right? Yeah, see, he's trying to sell that book. <laughs> Particularly that one, yes. I don't want to take it back to Scotland. Um, until we have gotten to a point where we can finally think about the finer arts of life, until we finally don't just have to grub and work and compete with each other, until we can finally think about what life is really all about. Right? So whether you look at, you know, Catherine was talking about John Maynard Keynes, you can go back to John Stuart Mill, you can go back to David Ricardo, you can go back to Karl Marx, nobody ever assumed that growth would continue. No more than parents think that children will continue to grow. Right? We have a term for growth that continues when it should no longer exist, and that is cancer. We have, by now, beyond reasonable doubt, arrived at that very moment where we're beginning to kill ourselves if we continue to grow. It is the moment where we can finally shift from growth to development, where we can think about not quantity but quality, where we can think about better, not more. But the only way we can do that is within a system that doesn't force and require us to keep growing. Right? And so this would take an, up another complete different evening as to why the system actually requires us to grow but it clearly does, ask any economist. 
And so what Catherine was referring to earlier, I would greatly um, advise you to look at at some point because it's just fascinating. And that is that letter of John Maynard Keynes to his grandchildren, in which he talks about a time in which we work no more than 20 hours a week, in which we have all basic needs taken care of, in which we can finally think about life in new and different ways as not just survival and not just struggle with scarcity. And he anticipated, and whenever he wrote in 1936, that this would take about 100 years. And we are very close to that. And so this is an amazing moment in history. As an historian, I think that we probably have never had a moment in history in which we faced greater challenges to our very existence. I think that's pretty safe to say. But it is equally safe to say that we have never in human history faced greater opportunities. Opportunities to create a world in which everybody is taken care of, in which nobody has to work 50, 60 hours a week, in which nobody lacks education, housing, health care. Right? We absolutely are at that moment in history. And so the gap between the challenge and the opportunity has never been wider. And so who, in the end, is it up to? It is up to we all. Right? It is up to us, because the system will not provide it. And I, we don't really care what we would call the alternative regenerative economics or whatever, but we do know that all the stuff that is being peddled to people these days and under the guise of sustainable growth or green growth or any of those things won't work. Right? There needs to be a fundamental shift away from this very toxic and very destructive system that is beginning to literally eat up everything. So with that small little final note, uh, I wanted to open up um, the floor once again to comments, suggestions, ideas, questions, anything you have. Mm -hmm. Mm. And that's the kind of city and the kind of university and the kind of school I would, or the kind of job I would want to attend, a place where I can grow as, an, as a person um, and heal maybe things that I have to work on. And I would love to see cities and spaces that provide that kind of tools and education that will make me help myself and help others. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I, let, me, let me just quickly clarify this, right? So, uh, in part, I'm falling victim to the very sort of neoliberal paradigm that we are part of. Uh, when I meant that there are limits to growth, I meant the growth that is being counted by GDP, right? It is very obvious that there are lots and lots of ways that we still want to grow. We want to grow in terms of our knowledge and our understanding of ourselves and our communities. We want to grow in terms of our health and so on and so forth, absolutely. Um, but the, the, the problem, I just want to throw that out, the, the problem is that it's not that simple, right? So many people think that, you know, like alternative energies or renewable energy or e-cars, for instance, right, can grow forever and they can't. Right? Most of the things that we do and grow actually have a fairly significant material footprint and therefore are probably not sustainable. But that's not to say that there aren't a lot of ways in which we still have to grow above all else in areas where people are still poor. Right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, thank you very much. Um, great talk. You, you haven't mentioned the word which you, which you are implying, um, perhaps, um, which is the Congress of degrowth. And I'm just Could wondering. You speak up a little? Oh, sorry. We have not talked about degrowth. Degrowth. And I'm just wondering. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> well, Sasha or Summer. <laughs> more popular here in Germany than it is in the UK as well. I think that's true. Yeah, yeah. So yeah. I'm just interested to hear what's your, I mean, yeah. uh, uh, you 
said that you could talk, you could tell the talk is you'll talk about degrowth, or is that is that a mm. is that a red herring in your opinion? As well? We might just take a couple, and then I think it's getting roasting hot in here, and we should break and have a beer and chat more informally. So yeah. Take one more question, then we'll do a wrap up. Is there someone this side, Martin? I know. Do you mind if we go to Martin? So spread the yeah. Go on. Well, I wanted to add to what you just said. I think one thought that could be helpful for thinking new possibilities rather than problems is whenever someone says, "Oh yeah, but we can't afford this," then that sentence, "We can't afford this," the city can't, the company can't, whoever can't always within the context and the confines of the rules that our current economic system is giving us. But that's all it is. It's rules on paper. Money is printed paper. So whenever you get this impression that the economic system that we have obeys it, makes it impossible, that's not a law of nature. And we tend to forget this. We've been brainwashed into thinking that our economic rules are like gravity. Well, we must have austerity because we can't afford it. Says who? Print more money. Yeah. Th that's part of the problem. So we'll be weighing two things, one against the other. It's on the one hand, just a bunch of rules we make up and put on paper, and the future of our species and of the planet. That's the two things that we're weighing against each other. And nowadays, people still tend to say, well, those laws and rules on paper way more, they're more important. We must follow them, rather than realize we've got this one plan. So when you set it all up, just make new fucking rules on new pieces of paper. I mean, it sounds like a revolution is necessary, and on some levels it is. We just have to get there in a peaceful way, and it's all in the real. Okay. Fantastic. Thank you. What do Couple of comments well, and I'll, okay. Um, thank you for those questions too. Really, really. Brilliant. I have some Sorry. comments, but why don't you start with um, comments? So on the degrowth question, so I'm, I'm really sympathetic to the analysis, um, but I'm not someone who uses the term. Um, I, I, because and proponents of degrowth, um, and and admittedly they say you know it's degrowth in the the rich countries in order to create ecological room for countries who have not yet got enough to grow more. Uh, and I think that aspect of climate justice is so fun fundamental. But in terms of, I, I, I try to speak across boundaries and work with folks wherever they are. And proponents of degrowth say it is a missile term. And I get that, I say they're wanting to be provocative and they're wanting to you know, put a grenade under the debate. But you know what, I don't think we need more missiles and I don't think we need more grenades. I think we need bridges and conversations and dialogue. So I talk about better than growth, but the term itself I don't think is actually a word that I find useful while I, despite being really sympathetic to why people use the term degrowth and absolutely in agreement with the analysis behind it. Uh, in, in terms of just, you know, let's get on and do stuff and that is so, so agree. I mean, the, folks don't know there's a UN report that came out in the last few weeks saying that in 10 years, the UK is going to have 
50% child poverty, and this is the fifth richest country in the world. And if you ever need any more evidence that GDP wealth is not a guarantee of good lives for all, you, the UK is it. Um, and so this sense of urgency that we just have to get on and start creating change, I entirely, entirely agree. And that part of that's what we always instigated is to support folks who, wherever they are, whatever their sphere of influence, if they're in business or in policy makers, if they're academics or or if they're community groups, just to support them and connect them and help build that momentum and those ripple effects to move on. And in, in terms of, um, you know, when are we heading off the cliff? There's a lot of folks who talk about that we need to be ready for crisis. And I, I actually, I find, that, um, I find that offensive because I, I spent almost 10 years of my life working for a huge international development organization, Oxfam. And part of that was working with folks experiencing desperate, desperate poverty in the UK. And a lot of that was working with communities around the world who cannot feed their kids enough to give them health um, to, so that they don't go to break bed hungry. And, People are already in desperate crisis. Um, and so for those of us who are fortunate enough to be in a position not yet gone off the cliff, it just takes us enough empathy to see that actually so many communities are already being driven off the cliff and all that we're doing is making that worse and, and worse. How I get hope uh, is through, you know, to be, to be really honest, when I have calls with people from WEAL, um, they're people from around the world who are who are just wanting to get on with being positive and constructive, but collaborating to make change, because we recognise that this is such a heavy lift, no of us, none of us can do it alone. And to be but slightly more specific, and I, I do get depressed loads, it sort of depends, you know, what day of the week it is, how hungover I am. It, it, it's, it's really hard not to get overwhelmed, because this is extraordinary, and all the signs are is that, you know, it's going to be really close shave. Um, but when I see students like We All Youth, who are the most intelligent, articulate, passionate people, who are just so positive about being part of a shift, I particularly find really inspiring all the students, particularly economic students, who are coming out of their classrooms and saying to their professors, stop teaching us this economics that is only relevant for the 20th century that ignores nature or dismisses it as an externality. I find those folks who are just trying to do something positive and so collegial and collaborative about that. That's how I, that's how I sort of wave, wave off that depression. Um, go ahead. Thanks for that question. Yeah, I don't have much to add to that. Um, I, um, I think that what we need really is to have a broader conversation about a possible vision for the future. We need a narrative, we need a story. And historically speaking, we had multiple stories. We had the story of capitalism and growth, we had the story of socialism, and we currently don't have a story. When I talk to my students, the most fundamental dilemma that really drives them almost to insanity is that they don't know how to do good and how to do well at the same time. How to make a living not being compromised, right? This is probably not unfamiliar to you. It's certainly familiar to me, too. I work at a private elite university. Uh, you know, what is that all about? Um, I still fly planes to conferences, which is really, on some level, utterly indefensible. Right? So we need a story and we need a narrative as to where this is going to go. And that really is what we all is all about. Um, we have essentially, we do have the understanding as to what the problem is by now. We know not just what is wrong with GDP, we know what is wrong with economic growth. Uh, we do not have a single persuasive model out there that can show how we could sustainably continue with growth. Right? And in that sense, of course, the degrowth community is absolutely right. Um, but how do we get to the next step is the big question. And when it comes to hope, I can't, you know, how would you, how would you even want to live without hope? If I see all these young people in my classrooms or on the streets or, you know, Fridays for Future, I mean, young people who literally, like Greta, is basically telling the adult world that we are not mature enough to run this place, 
and that we need to be replaced by young people who finally take this crisis seriously, that gives me enormous hope. And again, a lot of things are now percolating up that we didn't think were possible just you know, a few years ago, both good and bad. The extent to which the academic and political world is beginning to understand how bankrupt and toxic and dysfunctional the GDP world is was utterly unpredictable to me just a mere couple of years ago. Right? That's a good thing. That my country elected Trump for president was equally utterly unpredictable. And I would have bet good money on people not being that stupid. And yet, it happened. Right? So you have both of these um, developments, but there's plenty of reason to hope, and plus there's really no other way to live than with hope. And in terms of, you know, when are we going to drive it off the cliff? I think there are multiple cliffs, probably. Um, and we're close to it, and IPCC is basically giving us 12 years. That's really very little. It's, it's 11, 11 now, yes. Um, and so we have thresholds and cascade effects, and you know, we have a lot to look at. But we also have enormous opportunities still. And these kinds of communities that are built around we all and that are happening all over the place, of, you know, that we're trying to network, um, are providing partial answers, hope, community, sustenance, support, facilitation. And that's where the work needs to happen. So thank you so much for coming. Thank you very much.